Thanks, Brian. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone, first of all, for sticking around with us. I think uh, we've, we've really saved a, a terrific panel for you. And it's certainly my great fortune to uh, introduce this panel. This panel, I think you'll agree that it would be difficult to find a more capable and qualified group of individuals to speak on this subject. Though they don't need any real introduction in terms of a long one, I would like to highlight uh, a couple of uh, high points from their careers, starting to my left. Uh, uh, James Apothari this morning indicated that he was trying to find who were actually on the ground doing some of the initial reconstruction uh, work and st stabilization work in Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, to my left, we have one individual in particular. Uh, earlier in his career, he um, supported U.S. efforts uh, in Iraq with the Iraq Reconstruction Management Office, where he was the director from 2004 to 2005, and he coordinated international and U.S. assistance to Afghanistan from 2002 to 2003, so right in the initial stages of those of those conflicts. Um, of course, you'll know him as the Executive Vice President at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and he served earlier in Kiev as our ambassador of 2006 to 2009. And even earlier in that, I see uh, U.S. assistance efforts to the former Soviet states, and so you also coordinated that, so certainly well qualified to address this issue. General Rock Ricardo Marchio uh, is a Joint Force Command Brunson Commander. Um, he's been seized, with, he passed since 2014 with deterrence and defense efforts in his command, but certainly well before that, uh, well before that, Joint Force Command Brunson has been intimately involved in projecting stability and security uh, into Eastern Europe. Uh, General Marchio has commanded at all levels in just about every um, deployment that NATO or NATO allies have been a part of to include Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, and most importantly for us, uh, General Marchio is a 2000 graduate of the U.S. Army War College. And uh, Lieutenant General uh, Ben Hodge is retired. He holds the Persian Chair of Strategic Studies with the Center for European Policy Anal Analysis, where he recently led the development of the report securing the Sawaki Corridor, which examines issues related to strategy, statecraft, deterrence, and defense in Europe. I highly recommend that report to those who are interested in this subject. Uh, of course, General Hodges is best known for commanding U.S. Army Europe from 2014 to 2017 and NATO LANCOM from 2012 to 2014. Most importantly for me, General Hodges was my senior mentor when I was an Army War College Fellow in Europe, so welcome, sir. Uh, the security and stability of Europe, as we've been talking about all day, is essentially NATO has had a, a long history of, of doing this sort of thing, and that's particularly true with no other region as much as this particular one. I mean, from the very end of the Cold War, this has been something that, with which the alliance has been seized. But there's been one major difference that has occurred in the last four years, at least, um, maybe since 2008 with the Russian invasion of Georgia, certainly since 2014 with the annexation of Ukraine. Um, the Russian Federation has been an aggressive uh, underminer, uh, someone who has sought to sow the seeds, one might argue, of instability and insecurity uh, as opposed to NATO's efforts. So I think that's going to be a major topic, and it's, it's one of the things that I think makes this panel unique from a lot of the discussion that we that we heard earlier. Some of the key questions that we've highlighted to our panelists include how do we traject, therefore, stability in the face of Russian aggression? Uh, how do we strike a balance then between the projection of stability and sort of escalatory or seemingly provocative actions? Um, is that or should that even be a concern for NATO? And finally, how do concepts like projecting stability fit with and are coherent with, as we heard a discussion earlier today from General Hickman, I believe, with uh, deterrence and defense efforts, which are now ongoing simultaneously? So for that, I'll uh, turn to our first uh, speaker, Ambassador Taylor, whom I, we've asked to give us a sort of a broad scene setter for the region in terms of what are the major challenges and opportunities, and what, how does he see allies and NATO's efforts to support uh, a coherent Western approach taking shape? Daryl, thank you very much. General Ham, panel, glad to be here. Thank you very much for, for letting me lead this off. Um, I get the easy part of kind of the big picture. Um, um, and there is a big picture in, in Europe, as, as Daryl just said. Um, we're now looking at, a, at a, an opportunity, a challenge, um, great power competition. This has not been what we've been doing for the past uh, 27 years, the 27 years since the end of the, end of the Cold War. 
Um, and there's a related challenge, a r- related contest uh, between democratic nations and autocratic nations. And they're related, they're not the same. Um, even in Europe, we see that the uh, tensions between uh, democratic nations and, uh, and autocratic nations. And so it's a, it's a new challenge um, that, that we need to face. And NATO um, has been there, as Daryl just said, that NATO's been there at the beginning um, through the Cold War, but also NATO has been there uh, since uh, since uh, 27 years ago. I was at U.S. mission to NATO in uh, uh, 27 years ago. I was there from, 2000, from 1987, 1992, saw the Berlin Wall fall and saw the Soviet Union disappear, um, implode, um, and saw the change uh, that that brought in our thinking. There were, there were people in the United States and other places in the world that thought this was the end of history. This is, uh, it, we're now moving toward democratic way of governing, uh, market oriented, and the Soviet Union is no longer the challenge that it was, end of history. Well, turns out it's not the end of history. Um, I was also in Kiev, as, uh, as Daryl said, um, in 2008, um, which is partway through the story that I'm quickly going to relate uh, that sets the context uh, uh, for, for this conversation. In 2008, um, NATO uh, was meeting, as it does regularly, annually, uh, for its summit, and the summit in 2008 was in Bucharest. Uh, there were a couple of things on the agenda. One was to welcome in a couple of new members um, uh, uh, to, to NATO. Um, and then there was also the application of two other members, actually three, um, including Montenegro, but also the, the Georgians and the Ukrainians were asking to join the membership action plan, asking to join the map. Um, And so this Bucharest summit um, in 2008 um, was preceded by a a visit um, to Kyiv, to Ukraine, where I was serving um, by the President of the United States. So President Bush, um, because he wants to make the case to his fellow heads of state in Bucharest, when he goes there next, he, he came to Kiev first. He came to Ukraine to hear uh, from the Ukrainians what their aspirations were, why they were interested in a, in a, military, in a membership action plan. Um, and they were interested, uh, President Yushchenko told President Bush, in values. They were interested in defense, uh, but they were also interested in European values, and they wanted to, they wanted to commit to those. They wanted to be committed to those. Um, so... At the same time, people will remember, 2008, there was a U.S. election campaign going on. Um, uh, Both candidates, both uh, Senator McCain, um, Senator Obama, uh, supported Ukraine and Georgia for a membership action plan at at that time. So this was not a political problem in the United States by any means, but um, as we recall, the Germans and the French, I'm not sure where the Italians were, um, uh, said uh, no. Um, so uh, the Georgians and the Ukrainians uh, disappointed um, that they weren't offered uh, an opportunity to begin the process that would lead to, uh, to lead to membership. Another person um, who was at, at Bucharest was Vladimir Putin. Um, he had already been through his election, um, and he had stepped down. Uh, he was still president, but he was about to step down and turn over the presidency to his proxy, uh, Medvedev. Um, but he was there. Um, And he noticed a decision that the NATO alliance took. Uh, uh, Putin noticed that that we, the NATO alliance, was unwilling to offer membership or at least a path to membership to two of these countries that were right um, on on his border. I argue this led uh, then within four months um, to what happened in Georgia. Um, and th- as we know, the Russians invaded Georgia. Uh, they took advantage of, uh, of uh, small disputes there, the ongoing disputes between the Georgians, South Ossetians, Akaz, um, and the Russians. Um, and Putin, in a very well rehearsed and very well prepared invasion, um, uh, he, uh, he went almost to Tbilisi, um, but was convinced, uh, agreed to stop short of that and pull back uh, into Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, the Americans, we didn't do very much at that time. Uh, we asked the Europeans to actually handle this, and then uh, the French president did, uh, was responsible for negotiating what, that, what, what occurred there. Um, and we didn't 
do very much. Um, there were no real sanctions put on. Um, indeed, uh, as we know, President Obama was, was elected. Um, shortly after that, we began the reset because we were going to look beyond. We weren't going to be bothered by some of these problems uh, uh, that the Russians had caused, in particular in Georgia, and we were going to reset our relations with, uh, with Russia. Um, some initial gains, some initial benefits from that, but probably a mistake um, in retrospect. I think Mike McFall in his book would, would say uh, probably a mistake. Um, but that was a follow-on. The Georgia invasion, I think, was a follow-on to the decisions made in Bucharest. Um, not a strong response. Um, and 2014, as uh, Daryl just described, uh, uh, again, taking advantage of, uh, of the president of Ukraine being run out of this country um, and, this, and the ensuing uh, uh, un unrest and, and uncertainty, uh, the Russians annexed Crimea. Um, um, the green men that we talked about earlier showed up, and Mr. Putin, of course, said, no, they're not, uh, they're not Russians. Um, uh, they must be locals. Um, uh, later, he admitted that they were indeed Russians. Um, but so, and again, not much pushback, not much response. Um, it was sudden. It was unexpected. I mean, here is an invasion in Europe, um, first time. Um, uh, other than the than the Georgia one, and so this was this was a shock. Not a whole lot of pushback. Some sanctions put on, but not much really to deter. So later on that year in 2014, he, Mr. Putin, um, began to unsettle, to destabilize the southeastern part of Ukraine in Donbas. Um, finally, um, we, the United States. Um, took this seriously, and we started to put on serious sanctions. We pushed back. Uh, we put on serious sanctions against people that were responsible for those, those decisions. Uh, the Europeans followed. Um, it actually took uh, the shoot down um, of a Malaysian airline, civilian airliner, over Donbass, um, killing about 300 Europeans, uh, for the Europeans to really hit back with the sanctions that we had. And so w the, the Europeans, the Americans, the Japanese, the, the Canadians, the Australians, joined in sanctions against the Russians, serious sanctions. Um, and, and then um, this last year, um, this new administration finally provided some lethal weapons to the Ukrainians to be able to deter further aggression by the Russians, and I want to argue that some combination of those sanctions, which can get worse, um, and that military support that the United States provided and NATO provided um, to the Ukrainians has had a deterrent effect. Um, so the Donbas situation is a serious one. Here's 10,000 Ukrainians have been killed in the middle of Europe. Um, uh, so this is uh, uh, something that, that requires our attention and acquire, requires us to focus um, our military support, our political support on that part of, of Europe. There is a NATO role, and I'm, I'm sure others will, will speak to this, um, uh, but we should keep the door open. Um, I argue that NATO should keep the door open to Ukraine, um, to Georgia, the Moldovans uh, in their constitution, they say they're, they're not aligned, so the Moldovans are probably not interested in joining NATO, but the, but the Ukrainians and the Georgians are, um, and we ought to give serious consideration to that. Let me just close by saying, by trying to make this point um, that it's not the end of history. Um, democratic forms of government are not destined to succeed. Um, uh, uh, Tim Snyder um, at Yale has written a book called The Road to Unfreedom, uh, which I highly recommend people take a look at. And he argues there that 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 United States and the West, we tend to think that that uh, that success, that the that the that democratic forms of government are inevitable. They're not inevitable. They're not inevitable. We have to push hard. We have to work at this. Um, uh, another author is going to come out this week. Um, uh, Bob Kagan has written a book about the, the system that kept Europe 
um, from big power conflict um, over the past 70 years. And he, and he likens it to a jungle, uh, that this, this liberal order, this international order that kept the peace over the last 70 years is like NATO and, and the UN uh, pushing back on the jungle, um, which is still out there. And he reminds us that without that kind of push, the jungle grows back. That's the name of his book, so I, I recommend that as well. So that is the, I hope, a little unsettling um, uh, intro to, uh, to this panel, Daryl. Back to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. With that, if I'm still on, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about General Marchio, what uh, NATO has done to respond to that, uh, and where you see the focus of those efforts going uh, in the future, particularly JFC Brunson, obviously. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Let me start with a couple of points. The first one is that when you realize that you are one of the last to speak in a one day long uh, seminar and you realize that uh, most of the people sitting in front of you hate you just because you have the red light on your mic on. And it's, I am a little bit scared of this. And the second point I want to mention that despite I was a very much uh, received the honor or to be nominated a uh, PowerPoint Ranger at the Army War College. I have not prepared any slide for you, so be safe that you will not to you know, su support me with the slides. Um, anyway, I am uh, honored to be here today and also to support the United States Army and US Army Corps War College, of which has already been stated that I am uh, very proud to be have been in uh, Holmes. Um, as a uh, commander of JFC Brunsum, uh, that the perspective that I want to bring to this panel is from the operational uh, um, um, level point of view. My quarter is certified to be the joint task uh, force headquarters for NATO response force for this year. Uh, every second year we take this responsibility. Um, we act as uh, the out of theater uh, quarters for NATO uh, res uh, resolute support mission in Afghanistan. And uh, associated uh, with the today topics, we exercise command over NATO enhanced for presence forces in the Baltics and the Poland. Uh, in addition, we work side by side with a network of formal partnership with no neighbor countries such Ukraine and, and, and the Georgia, which uh, we have the, uh, the students here in this room today, Sweden and Finland as well, pursuing practical military cooperation in support of NATO three core tasks. As you may have observed from this list, on a day-to-day -day basis, my quarters practically execute deterrence, defense, crisis management, and projecting stability operation. This is our everyday normal, balancing a mission clearly focused on out of area operations in, uh, in Afghanistan, while simultaneously having OPCON over forces on our eastern flank, focus on deterrence and clearly demonstrating our commitment to Article 5 of the NATO trade Treaty. Uh, the diversity of our missions naturally raise questions which are highly pertinent with the today uh, topics. Is projecting stability an or rather than an end when associated with the security? Is every dollar spent on deterrence and defense a dollar not spent on projecting stability? Do our activities to bolster our defense on the east come at the expense of our activities to the south? Are our efforts to combat the threat of terrorism, human trafficking, and irregular migration mutually exclusive from effort to combat Russian aggressive action to undermine Euro-Atlantic security and the rules-based international order? Are NATO three core values, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security done in isolation one from another, or do they mutually reinforce one another? Before I go any further, uh, let me focus for just a moment uh, on uh, the topics of this panel, the East, 
and explain just what NATO and answer for presence is, the FP, as we call it. At the Warsaw Summit in 2016, Alliance Head of State and Government agreed to forward four battalion-sized combat-capable battle group to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Since 2016, 19 NATO nations, and, and the United States is one of the nations, as a framework nation for the, the battle group that, which is deployed in, uh, in uh, Poland, <clears throat> the, those nations have contributed the, uh, forces which are fully nested and integrated into the, the force structure and homeland defense plans of the host nations. Effectively, we have almost doubled the combat capability of the three Baltics and greatly bolstered Poland. In addition, as of November this year, we will have a certified division and a corp quarter in Poland with another divisional headquarters in Riga standing up shortly. We have completely shifted our exercise regime to ensure joint training for the four battle groups, shift our planning to incorporate the EFP's forces into NATO defense plan, and shift our focus to ensure the credibility, both logistically and operationally, of those forces. But wait a moment. The seminar is about projecting stability. And that implies our neighbors, not nation within our Atlantic uh, uh, area. That implies uh, uh, stabilizing weak or failing states. That implies Afghan or Iraq, right? But I think we have not to go so fast. I believe, and I have heard uh, Jonas Caparotti state on multiple occasions, that stability is the very thing which is currently under attack. Instability is the very goal of our adversary, all of our adversaries. Our summit communique and declaration willingly state that threat as Russian and violent extremism, the use of terrorism. But to what end? The goals of our two defined threats are the same, instability. Stability within the Euro Atlantic area or outside of it. Ultimately, Russia, Russia and terrorists don't like today to define the world order. They don't like the West, Western institution and values. They do not value freedom, individual liberty, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. While both their methodology, means, and ideology differ, their desire and state is remarkably similar. So why we look at this threat in isolation from one another? We cannot and we shouldn't. Our threats pose a common challenge and we must respond to them with a comprehensive strategy. This strategy uses operations both within and outside the Euro-Atlantic area. It uses military hard power, political soft power, economic aid and development, and even military forces to train, advise, and assist, all with the goal to comprehensively defend the Euro-Atlantic region, our value, and our institutions. Therefore, I would like to answer to the many questions that I posed before with a single word, complementarity. Projecting stability and deterrence and defense endeavors complement each other. Effective crisis management complements our deterrent posture. Continued commitment to collective defense stabilizes our defense agencies and complements our effort to project stability into our periphery. I think uh, out our resolute uh, support mission in Afghanistan illustrate this point very clearly. Why we go out of area to train, advise, and assist Afghan security institution and this contributes to the stability within Afghanistan, but also protect the Euro-Atlantic area by preventing safe haven for terrorists and even confronting them on their own turf. I also has the positive side effect of improving interoperability and practical day-to-day -day and lower level uh, cooperation. This projecting stability operation clearly complements 
our deterrence and defense effort and even prevent potential crises from arising. I think one of the difficulties when, uh, we have when we try to understand the complementarity of our mission is that we have become accustomed to using project instability on a geographical terms, solely for use when doing something about, behind the NATO uh, borders. However, with the backdrop of political and social development in our countries in recent years, most of the publics would ask why we are limiting our effort on stability in that way. Violent extremism, disinformation campaign, Russian activities up to the end, including murder or attempted murder in the UK, all point to be uncomfortable fact that we can no longer assume that we are safe within NATO border. The so-called hybrid warfare, as been mentioned several times this morning, reaches across all domains and comes in the form of undermining our institution, values, and way of life. If this isn't instability, I am not sure what is it. I personally think that NATO needs to include this challenge in its thinking about projecting stability. You may be thinking that I am an officer, a military officer, and these are political challenges. The reality is that NATO is a political military organization, and in the world of hybrid warfare, our adversary <clears throat> do not respect clear divining line. I am therefore not sure we should. We cannot check the risk that NATO military assets will become less relevant because we haven't worked out how to use our military capability in an effective way as a part of a political strategy, not just to deter conventional military or nuclear action, but to deter aggression to the day to day in peace. This is a difficult thing to achieve. At the moment, the public perception of NATO is colored by the media report around the summit. Most recently in Boston, the picture painted over was over the growing political disagreement between the United States and the Europeans on the, uh, the burden uh, sharing, uh, so about the, uh, the, the money. Uh, but, I, uh, but we know that it was only a small part of the summit. At the Brussels summit, just to quote General Scaparotti, the decision and published declaration provide some of the most clear direction and guidance to the NATO operational command in years. We had stood up the new Joint Force Command with clearly defined responsibility to protect the light of communication across the Atlantic Ocean and ensure logistic support in peace, crisis, and conflict. We will stand up a new cyber command with responsibility to deter, defend, and counter the full spectrum of cyber threat. We have declared a commitment to supporting Ukraine maintaining our four presence force in the Baltics, Polonia, Poland, and Romania. We committed to the NATO Readiness Initiative and Enablement Plan to ensure timely mobility and sustainment of forces across the area of responsibility. Our immediate military path is clear, but it is true that there are further conversations to, have been, to have, be had between all parts of NATO to work out how this political and military organization interacts. Which lead me to uh, my last point, which is to answer where I see future conflict playing out. I'm not speaking geographically. I'm speaking in terms of time and phase. In the past, we have labeled those action conflict or competition short of war. We call it phase zero or even peace. But that is where we see future conflict arising, and the military must be prepared and trained to engage even this gray zone. As an operational commander, I have the luxury of seeing how our threats are acting today during peace to undermine our stability. I have the responsibility of working to counter these threats, and NATO is becoming even more willing to acknowledge the need to act during what we want to call peace but which is more and more characterized by aggressive competition amongst powerful states and non-state actors. In summary, 
I hope uh, you have encouraged by development within NATO to address, to address today's threats. In addition, I hope I have been able to clearly illustrate the complementarity nature of projecting stability operations with our effort on the East. Thank you for your time and for your attention. Of course, I am available for any question. Thank you. Thank you, General Marchio. And uh, General Hodges, I know you've been a, you were a part of leading a lot of these efforts that General Marchio just talked to us about. Uh, and you've had a few months now at least to reflect. Uh, we just ask if you might unpack a bit about what we're missing and where we go from here, or where we should be going from here anyway. Thanks, Daryl. As I look in this room, it reminds me of the Presbyterian Church I grew up in in Quincy, Florida. Uh, only the deacon sat on the front row, and everybody else sat as far back in the sanctuary as they possibly could. And uh, the reason we did that, of course, was so you, as soon as the service was over, you could dash out the door and beat the Baptist to the only cafe that we had in Quincy, Florida. The, uh, whereas uh, Catholics, of course, always sit in front so they can hurry up and take communion and get the hell out of there. Uh, so it's a... So it's a different mindset. So that's why Agolia is sitting up pretty close to the front here. So um, kind of, I'd like to um, make my comments in, in three general areas, and, and and I would I would look forward to being challenged on any of these things because if they were easy, you know, we wouldn't even be talking about them. Uh, first is on U.S. leadership in Europe and in, within the alliance. The second is on some specific things that the Russians are doing. And the third is how is our great alliance uh, adapting and also how is the U.S. Army adapting. Uh, NATO is the most successful alliance in the history of the world. That, that doesn't mean it's perfect. But when you're talking about the nature of coalition warfare over, let's say, the last 5,000 years, uh, NATO has gotten it right. And there's a reason that next year we'll be celebrating the 70th anniversary uh, of the signing of the Washington Treaty and the birth of our uh, great alliance, which has um, safeguarded uh, not just Europe, but um, North America and Europe for all these uh, many decades. And it's uh, the, the thing that I hear from our allies all the time, even the, our allies who are so critical of U.S. policy get mad with us or get grumpy with us, they all say we need American leadership. That doesn't mean hegemony, but they need, they want American leadership. And the United States has always provided this sort of an ideal um, for so many, uh, so many of our allies. And it, I believe it's the number one element for maintaining stability in Europe. And so, frankly, every time the president, our president, criticizes the alliance, uh, questions its relevance, uh, says it's uh, outmoded, um, and for the first time in my life, when the president of the United States questioned. I don't know, Montenegro, you know, they're very aggressive. I'm not sure that we would, I mean, I, I was astounded, as I'm sure most of you were, that the President of the United States would put into question our commitment to Article 5. Um, the cohesion of the alliance is the one thing that the Russians hate more than anything else, the cohesion of our alliance. Because um, when they look at 29 countries, the combined populations, economies, and militaries, and all the, the, the power that comes from 29, as you heard uh, uh, one of the panelists earlier this morning talked about uh, Bill Heckman. Uh, you know, the power of 29 is incredible. Uh, the Russians have no desire to take on 29. When I was a lieutenant, like many of you, you know, we thought the big red arrow was coming across the inner German border. They certainly had plans to do that. Uh, today, they, they don't have the capacity or capability or desire to do that. Uh, what they want to do is wreck the international order that has provided such security, both with European Union. Uh, as well as uh, our great alliance. And so every time the President of the United States or anybody puts into question the challenges of the cohesion of our alliance, or even things like Brexit, it is a catastrophe uh, for all of us. Uh, that is a gift to the Russian Federation, and it creates a seam that they, will ab that they are absolutely exploiting. Um, the, uh, the riots that were in Chemnitz, Germany, just a couple of weeks ago, we know that GRU was providing money to right-wing extremist groups to encourage them and enable them to participate in those riots. Th this is exactly um, what they do and, um, as part of what they're trying to do to break up the cohesion of our great alliance. It's also uh, why I'm concerned, not everybody agrees with me, but uh, when Poland offered to the United States, we'll give you $2 billion, just with a B, um, to uh, put permanent basing of U.S. troops in Poland. And there was quite a few people thought, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea unless you get 29 nations 
that agreed to it. You know, when, when the alliance at Warsaw said, you know what, we're going to deploy these enhanced forward presence battle groups that General Marchio referenced, 29 nations, 28, and then Montenegro joined, how powerful it was. And the fact that Germany uh, was the first country to say, we will lead one of those battle groups and we'll go to Lithuania. I, that put pressure on everybody else. All the other Europeans like, oh, shit, the Germans are doing that. We're going to have to do it. And so now you've got a uh, British-led battle group, Canadian, first time Canadians are back on the continent of Europe in many, many years, German-led battle group, and then American-led battle group in Orzhich in northeast Poland. By the way, Tennessee Army National Guard is taking over that mission uh, right now, replacing the 2nd Cavalry Striker Unit. That's the cohesion that sends such a powerful uh, message uh, of deterrence. But if we do this, uh, if we agree to the basing in Poland, permanent basing, so we're talking about Dodd schools, PXs, you know, the whole thing, that's what permanent uh, means, uh, then I think uh, at least half of our allies are going to go crazy on this. I, I think my record's pretty solid that I don't care about provoking Russians, um, but our allies, will ha there will be a Russian response. They they'll respond, and they but they will see it as an opportunity that they've already abrogated the NATO Russia founding act. Their their illegal annexation of Crimea. They already changed the security environment. Their invasion of Georgia. So everything that the NATO Russia founding act was based on, they already blew that apart. But most of our European allies would say just because the Russians did that does not mean that we should therefore say to heck with it. But the Russia will seize this as an opportunity to put troops, try to get them in Belarus or do something else because they'll be threatened by these 87 American tanks that would not fill up uh, FedEx football field up here, but somehow this is a huge threat to Russian security. And so they will use this as an opportunity. And I think if we're going to do permanent basing in Poland, and I know the NDAA tells the, the Department of Defense to examine it, then we need to make sure that we were going forward with all of our allies. It would be a huge mistake, I think, to do it bilaterally. Plus, most people would see this as actually we're just doing this to punish the Germans for not spending more because either the army would grow, which is extremely unlikely, um, or else they're going to come out of Europe. And so I think uh, nothing good will, will come out of this. And by the way, some of you have been in the, in the business for a while. Two billion dollars, that will barely keep the lights on uh, for uh, an army installation uh, for one year. So this, is, this will be a bill that the army or the department uh, will be stuck with. Two percent uh, burden sharing. Um, absolutely, uh, our allies need to be doing more. It's incomprehensible that Germany, um, you know, the nation that is synonymous with engineering, uh, has an atrocious uh, readiness rate. It's not because they don't know how to do it, but they're having to undo decisions that were made 10 years ago, just like we are. I mean, we sent home our, all our tanks. The last American tank went home five years ago. Unbelievable. The great 12th Combat Aviation Brigade almost wiped out. So now we're having to spend zillions of dollars to bring all that stuff back. So the Bundeswehr is having to do the same thing. Uh, they're, they're putting a ton of money into rebuilding readiness inside those great formations. Um, but they still could be doing more. Unfortunately, when the president kicks them in the ass all the time about 2% and clubs our allies over the head, it has the opposite effect. I guarantee you not one single country is spending more money because our president has said, you know, you're not paying, you're not paying enough. First of all, these are not club dues. I mean, two percent about investing in yourself, but the way it gets characterized is you're not paying your your share is 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 not helpful. And there's not one not one member of the Bundestag, I guarantee you, that wants to be seen as responding to or trying to please the American president. So there's no way they're gonna they're gonna do it. So we have to take a much more sophisticated approach. I'm not against two percent, but by itself, it's not helpful. So we need a much more sophisticated approach that would incentivize Germany, for example, or the Netherlands, or Italy, or Spain, or Norway uh, to do more to contribute to collective security. Now, uh, Russia, uh, I don't think Russians think, and I'm not a Russia expert, but I don't think that they think of war, we're at war, not at war. And we're all struggling, is it hybrid, is it gray zone, is it some Gerasimov doctrine? I, th I think it's Russian. I just call it Russian way of war. And uh, they turn it up and turn it down or combine all the different elements of, of power to achieve the effect that they want to achieve. Um, whether it's this 300,000 alleged exercise out in uh, the Vostok 18, it's probably 
two hundred something plus, and they but they expand the numbers when they need to. Whereas last year, unbelievably, most Russian exercises have exactly twelve thousand seven hundred, just below the uh, the limit required for notification. When everybody knows uh, above the rank of second lieutenant, there there were at least a hundred thousand troops involved in their exercise last year, the Zapad exercise. But this is classic Russian misinformation, and unbelievably, some serious uh, people will swallow this half the time because they don't want to provoke the Russians. The Russians only respect strength. They only respect strength exactly as Admiral uh, Ambassador Taylor. You should be an admiral also, sir. I mean, how hard can that be? The, uh, <laughs> the uh, well, Mike Franken left, so I'm going to take a shot at him. The, um, they only respect strength. Uh, the chief, uh, now Minister of Defense of Turkey, General Akar, told me, he said, you know, when the U.S. And the, and the Brits failed to live up to the red line in Syria, that was a clear signal to them going ahead, and that's, and that's when they went into uh, Crimea, the week after the Sochi Olympics, by the way. So they spent a zillion ruble to show the world how wonderful they are and how great hosts they are, and then a week later they, they launch an invasion. So uh, that, that should tell you right there, or the fact they used a chemical weapon uh, in England to kill, try to kill uh, uh, former spy Mr. Skripal and his, and his daughter. And I'm sure many of you watched the uh, interview on Russia uh, Today, uh, the uh, the two poor guys who were just tourists, they want, they heard about this great cathedral in Salisbury. Uh, never in 40 years I've had any British friends say, you've got to go to Salisbury. It's absolutely beautiful there. Uh, nobody has ever said that to me. Uh, it was like watching Chris Farley on a Saturday Night Live skit. The, uh, but, but they do it. I mean, this is, this is who they are. Um, the fact that they're holding this exercise with, with 200, 300,000 troops uh, while they've got serious domestic issues on their pension reform and their economy, which is, you know, I don't think anybody in this room owns anything that was made in Russia except when they're little stackable dolls. Um, they're still going to spend that much money uh, on this exercise. That tell you, tells you where their priorities are. Um, on my little map here, I'm sorry I failed to bring a pointer. Um, the Sea of Azov, right here, so the Minsk, the Minsk process, the Minsk agreement, Russia's a signatory to that. This is supposed to stop the fighting in uh, Ukraine and get to a political um, solution, which is what we want. Um, they, but then they build this gigantic bridge that connects Crimea to mainland Russia. What a slap in the face to the Bundeskanzler of Germany, to, president, to the president of France, and everybody else is hoping that this process will work. It, they're just telling you, we're never, ever in a zillion years planning to give back Crimea. Never because we just built a gigantic bridge. And by the way, that bridge also now is a gate, which enables them, along with the Russian Navy, to, to disrupt all traffic going in and out of the Sea of Azov. Well, why does that matter? Well, because Mariupol, which is the key export city, uh, along with Odessa for Ukraine, now in their steel export, they're just going to drain it. It's like you know the Union Navy blockading the uh, uh, port of Wilmington. I mean, it's going to dry up be because of, of what they're doing there. Uh, not many, too many people in Washington wake up in the morning and think, oh, man, they're, they're, they're screwing over the Ukrainians there in the Sea of Azov. And there are Ukrainian soldiers getting killed every single week. Every week, Ukrainian soldiers are dying. This is three years after uh, a ceasefire was signed. So we have got to keep pressure on them. We have got to stick with Ukrainians. We have got to stick with our allies and partners. I think that the, uh, the third and final bit here is uh, what the, our, our great alliance is doing. It was addressed somewhat during the Brussels summit, although everybody was distracted by the focus on 2%. Uh, and I won't repeat all the things that General Marchio just said, some great adaptation. This alliance knows how to adapt. We've continued to adapt. And, you know, there's nobody knocking on the door of Kremlin saying, please let me back in. I really want to be a part of your security arrangement. Everybody wants to join the alliance because of what it what it represents. And that's why I think Georgia needs to be admitted immediately. Not everybody's in favor of that, but um, I, I think that if we allow Russia to veto what a nation wants to do, this is not the 18th century. We know where three or four great powers kind of traded away other countries. This is the 21st century. Um, Georgia has nothing else to prove. They need to be a part of the alliance, and we need to figure, we need to tell the Russians that uh, they don't get to veto what um, nations are trying to do. Thankfully, the U.S. Congress has been extremely supportive, and the, and the Trump administration deserves credit. Everything that the Obama administration promised at the Warsaw Summit, rotational forces, all the equipment for a division, pre-position on the ground, uh, rotational aviation brigade, 
and several other things, the Trump administration is delivering. That's all happening. I mean, all the equipment for division being brought back to Europe and put in storage in Poland, the Netherlands, Germany, and uh, Belgium. Plus, the U.S. Congress has increased three years in a row what's called European Deterrence Initiative. It was European Reassurance Initiative at first, but it's now it's EDI. I mean, big money, and that's what pays for all these rotational forces and exercises. That's how we get the Guard and Reserve over there. It's essential to what we're trying to do. So with that, I will uh, look forward to Please challenge me on some of these things. Uh, the Army has learned from this, and I think most of you are familiar with a lot of stuff the Army is trying to do now, not just bringing troops back, but also electronic warfare. We have to learn how to hide, again, avoid detection. We've learned a lot from our Ukrainian uh, partners. Thanks. With that, I'd like to go directly to questions so we can maximize the amount of time we have left. Uh, we have the microphones going around, so uh, who's first? Yes, ma'am. Gentlemen, thank you for your questions. My name is Corey Flesser. I work in the AFRICOM J5. Um, I wanted to follow up on a comment that you said, uh, General Hodges, about uh, NATO's 2%. And you mentioned that the, the club approach to beating our allies into doing it is probably not the best, that we need to offer incentives. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on some of those incentives from your perspective um, that you think may work. Thank you. The, the first thing we need to talk about is capabilities. I mean, there is another construct out there called three C's, uh, capabilities, uh, contributions, and cash. So, I mean, there is a, a financial aspect of this, but um, things like cyber, for example, I mean, uh, General Nakasone's uh, Cyber Command does not provide cyber protection for air traffic control in the United States. Um, we depend on German uh airspace, uh, French airspace, Italian airspace, that doesn't come out of their defense budget, the cyber protection, for example, for those kind of things. There are a lot of uh, capabilities that are necessary for U.S. Uh, national defense strategy and for us to do operations, for example, that requires cyber protection. I think all of that should count towards collective security. Um, I think we need more German trains, not more German tanks. Uh, right now, there is just enough rail capacity uh, to move one brigade. That's not one American brigade. That's one brigade total uh, in all of Europe at one time, which is pathetic, especially the old, the old guys in here who remember trains moving all day and night, thousands of armored vehicles moving around. That was West Germany, of course. Now we're talking about being able to move from, say, uh, bomb holder all the way out to Tallinn. That's the same as going from Jacksonville, Florida to New York City. That's how far we got to move, and there's just enough rail capacity to move one brigade at one time. So um, I think we could incentivize Germany, for example, to uh, any infrastructure that has demonstrable dual-use capability, like rail, uh, bridges. Uh, that There ought to be a formula where that counts. Now, I'm not in favor of foreign aid counting. I know some people offer that. This is specific to infrastructure. Uh, transportation, and by the way, the further east you go, uh, the less and less infrastructure you have. Um, anything that we're going to have to do is going to go through Poland, and uh, north North Poland is it's like Minnesota. I mean, there are more lakes up there than uh, than in Minnesota, and so bridges that can hold Abrams tanks, um, uh, Leopards, it's like 90 tons. I mean, it's uh, that infrastructure needs to be uh, expanded for us to do what we have to do to provide deterrence. So. There's got to be a formula that would in encourage that. Uh, th those are some examples. But when I when I mentioned that to uh, our ambassador to NATO, she said, no, no, we want them buying more jets and tanks. No, ma'am, that's, that's not what we want them doing. We, we need capabilities, and, and so those are some examples, I think. Brian? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, excellent uh, conversation this afternoon. I'm a, a Colonel Brian Foster from the Peacekeeping Stability Operations Institute and the Chief of Peace Operations. Um, in the press, uh, there's been talk of some sort of peacekeeping force uh, in the Ukraine. I'd be interested uh, in your all's uh, thoughts on if, uh, if that's viable and would, uh, would NATO uh, take part in that. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
We've done some work on this um, with, uh, with input from Ukrainians and Russians and Germans and French and others um, thinking about how we can get the Russians out of Donbass. Um, um, and part of that is a peacekeeping force. Um, part of that is some kind of an interim administration, a civilian administration um, uh, to, to run Donbass while <clears throat> the forces uh, supported by the Russians are either dismantled or removed back into, uh, into Russia. But a peacekeeping force is, is important. Um, it's got to be robust. Um, it would have to be uh, authorized by the UN Security Council, um, which means the Russians have to agree. Um, so the assumption is that the, that the Russians are looking for a way out, looking for a way to get out of Donbass. Um, we've said it's expensive. Um, the sanctions are hurting. Uh, General Hodges talked about uh, uh, the problems that the Russian economy has had right now. Uh, Mr. Putin's uh, support has dropped dramatically because he's had to raise the retirement age. Um, he can't fund uh, the pensions of, uh, of his teachers. So he's having difficulty, and my, my bet is uh, that he would like to get out of Donbass. It's pretty expensive. So, so in the Security Council, um, one could hope um, some reason to believe um, that he would be willing, if there's a reasonable way, um, to allow him to save some face, which would be okay with the Ukrainians, um, and, and get out of Donbass. And the peacekeeping force is a part. NATO's probably not a component of that. Um, um, uh, and neither are the Russian allies. Um, uh, we've done some thinking about what nations could uh, be force contributing nations, probably not NATO and probably not uh, uh, CSTO. Sure, go ahead. No, I would like just to add uh, something that, uh, that's uh, just related to the last uh, point by the ambassador. Of course, NATO, as has already been very clearly stated, is very much uh, founded over uh, the cohesion of the coalition. So some uh, of the decisions that are referred to those uh, initiatives are to be uh, analyzed against the co cohesion uh, issue. That is uh, quite uh, uh, difficult to be reached when the situation is not so clear, no, so it's a little bit blurry. And, and that is uh, what we fight every day when we are responsible for some kind of deterrence, but to be able not to be provocative, not to be perceived like uh, uh, trying to uh, provoke any reaction by Russian. Um, and that is important, and then and it brings me also to think about how we can coordinate the efforts, because I don't think we can analyze the Ukrainian issue and to keep this isolated by others uh, initiatives that are taken by Russia, and that can uh, put us to take a decision or initiative in other areas. Um, this is an issue that is probably uh, not in our nature as a soldier when we need to have a very very precise area of responsibility, very precise uh, uh, action to be taken. But in this case, uh, because of what we have said so far, that we are working in a very great area. Everything needs to be considered before we take uh, an initiative that could be not approved and not accepted by part of our uh, allies. That is, of course, is a problem, and I understand that we don't have the initiative in this case, because we have to pass through a process, as being mentioned this morning, which is relatively slow. Uh, but more than slow, it's not just a matter of speed. It's a matter of uh, uh, to be to agree on position that sometimes is not easy to be agreed by the 29. So I think this is something that we should consider. Uh, just to add my little bit to it, um, I, I agree with the, the ambassador that there's no way the Russians would allow NATO to be a, a part of something like this. And frankly, I don't, I don't think we'd want to be. But, um, you know, it'd have to, it would need to be a very professional kind of force like Swedes or Finns that everybody would respect. Or it could come from uh, uh, some other countries as well, of course. Um, but the Russians have demonstrated uh, they stomped all over OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the observers who were there to help make sure that the uh, Minsk uh, process was being uh, done correctly. The ceasefire 
Uh, the entire border between Ukraine and Russia is wide open so that there's no OSC monitoring of this endless uh, ammunition and uh, advisors and, and Russian leadership that's going back and forth into the Donbass. So um, it would have to be something like um, the Dayton Peace Accord where you had the military was involved in making sure that the tasks that were provided to this peacekeeping force were as robust as what the I-4 had in 19, when they went in in 1995. It would need to be something like that. And the, and the Russians would, uh, I think they would be very grudging in doing that. But, you know, Germany, at the reunification of uh, East and West Germany, uh, and you had hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops uh, sitting in East Germany, they had nowhere to go. I mean, they had nowhere to go. And so Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, paid a zillion uh, Deutschmarks at the time to pay for housing and to transport Soviet soldiers back to Russia because Russia couldn't even, they couldn't afford it. And so maybe there's a something uh, along those lines that could be a, a part of this. Can we uh, go up here to the uh, second row and then uh, back to uh, Jim after that? Gentlemen, I'd like to get your thoughts on how do we, how could we incorporate somewhere like the Ukraine or Georgia into NATO, given the presence of Soviet troops and the fact that there is basically a, an unwritten war going on in there? How could we do that? What's the risks to NATO in trying to do something like that? And would the rest of uh, NATO view that? I mean, the U.S. sees that as a possibility. Maybe you do, Ben. But, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Taylor, in general, I'd like to get your views and then Ben's views on why he thinks it's a good idea. Um, as I say, they are opening this uh, discussion. I, of course, I, I bring the operational level that is uh, very much will transform uh, strategies and uh, and uh, general concept and something practical to be executed. So I would say that uh, the support we can provide has to be very indirect cannot be perceived like the, 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 the provocation that we mentioned before. So uh, I think that the traditional means of um, projecting stability, that it's a physical presence and the support to the, the, the action that could be labeled as, as a NATO intervention, I think it's very difficult to be seen in the near future, both for uh, Ukraine and and, uh, and Georgia, and also because of the decision process, probably would be quite painful for the reason that the ambassador mentioned before. Uh, I don't think there is a consensus uh, in, in, around this issue um, that would bring to a direct uh, uh, intervention in the in the countries. Obviously, we will continue to push, and uh, as we already said several times, we have to continue to maintain this pressure on the on the on the issue. But don't, I don't think we can expect a, a, a revolutionary uh, decision in, uh, in a short time. Yeah, it's, it's not in a short time. It's going to take time. It's going to take time for the Ukrainian military, um, as well as the society, to get the standards that NATO requires, which is what the Membership Action Plan does. And it's a long process. Um, it can be a long process. But some indication that, A, the door's open, and B, that that process can start, um, and that process has a lot of support coming from NATO nations um, to the military, to civilian control of the military, to interoperability, all the things that you know better than I. Um, that's the kind of process that, that certainly can start. So for sure, there, there will be uh, anxiety, there already is, about Georgia because of the fact, John, as you said, 10,000 Russian troops occupying 20% of Georgia now, Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia. But I would, I would couch it as this is in response to, Georgia, to Russia's invasion of Georgia and their occupation. And so the alliance uh, putting, uh, bringing Georgia into the alliance is a response to that in order to protect Georgia from further Russian aggression. The um, 
And when you think about its, it's geographical uh, location, we should have done this immediately after Crimea, by the way. As um, soon as they went into Crimea, we should have had bold leadership that said, okay, you've done this, now here's what we're going to do. And, and that, at that point, probably was enough momentum and support within with our European allies that we could have actually gone much more boldly into Poland, for example, and, and done some things. Now we've waited too long, I think, and, and we won't have support of our European allies. Um, but if you look at the uh, geographic location of Georgia, and with this, uh, what I anticipate over the next 10 to 15 years being a huge increase in east-west trade coming through Eurasia, um, and with Georgia beginning uh, work on a port called uh, Anaklia, which is will be big enough to handle 10,000 TEU ships, every the biggest ships that could come through the Bosphorus will now be able to uh, go into Georgia. That will that will shave about three weeks off the sailing time for a, a container ship coming from Shanghai going to Antwerp once this port is complete, which they think will be done by about 2020, 2021. Um, now all of a sudden you've got three meaningful corridors for east-west trade. One goes through Russia, one goes through Iran and Turkey, and one will go through Georgia. Uh, which one do you think will be the most reliable and, and uh, dependable? And so uh, I do believe that there is security value in economic dependence. So all of a sudden, or by, when you have that big port there, uh, Georgia becomes this portal as the East European country portal between Eurasia and Europe. Uh, it will be in everybody's interest that Georgia stays open and viable, which will increase its, its uh, security as well. And I, I think that makes it uh, another reason why having it in the alliance you know, because everybody will have a stake in, in Georgia's uh, security. Now, uh, I, I would also recommend that we, we would start putting rotational troops in Georgia just the way we did in, in Lithuania and Estonia. I mean, a company. I mean, it was a company of paratroopers that first went into each of those countries. And, um, of course, um, the guys in Vicenza would say, yeah, all you need is a company of paratroopers. You don't need an armor brigade. But anyway, um, the uh, rotating troops through Georgia um, – with having an American presence in there would, would uh, also, I think, uh, uh, be useful. Gentlemen, excellent panel. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jim DeCrocco. I'm the uh, director of the Defense Strategy Course at the U U.S. Army War College. And my question is, uh, uh, other, as about other avenues to seize the initiative from the Russians in Europe. Um, you've talked about Poland, you've talked about Georgia, um, what other areas are there that uh, we can seize the initiative from the Russians in order to uh, maintain or reestablish stability in Europe? Hey, Jimmy, thanks. Um, well, first of all, uh, competing in the uh, information space, uh, not countering everything that they do. I mean, just like this clown show that was the RT interview the other day with the two knuckleheads, uh, uh, their tourists that went to Salisbury. Um, we have such a better story to tell. I mean, there are people in, in my dime died with an EU flag in their hand because they saw how much better life was in Poland after Poland joined the alliance and joined the European Union. They were willing to do whatever it took to, to be like that. I mean, so we have such a better story to tell uh, in the West, uh, which, of course, is exactly why the Russians are spending uh, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars, euro, to uh, uh, undermine uh, our trust in each other, undermine our trust in our own institutions, you know, our judicial system, our electoral process. Uh, General Breedlove used the phrase one time, I hope I get this right, he said, they have weaponized uh, the, the refugee problem. I mean, there's a, there's a reason that they are um, have chosen sides with the Assad regime, which uses chemical weapons against their own people, because it puts about three and a half million refugees on the road, all coming to Europe. And and we are, I think, we're all aware of the challenges that has created, in addition to refugees coming out of Africa. People want to blame uh, Chancellor Merkel for opening the door, but those, but she's not the one that started the the flow. It was. Uh, the S Syrian civil war beginning about six years ago, 
And, and I remember back then, Turkey said, 40,000, that's the max that we could possibly handle. Well, there's three and a half million in Turkey right now, and a million, of course, have already gone on into Europe. Um, we've got such a better story to tell. And I think we have to uh, be very clear-eyed, uh, stick together, um, keep shining the light on what Russia is doing. I mean, I don't know how the Germans will continue with the Nord Stream 2 if their Russian partner in this venture is, um, uh, continues to side with the Syrians and chemical weapons get used, for example, in, uh, in Idlib, if that happens. That, that would be very difficult. We've, we've got to be unified in this. Uh, I think the European Union gets great credit for maintaining sec sanctions after all these years uh, on Russia. That, that has to continue. So that's, that's part of how we get the initiative. We have a better story to tell. Uh, in Florida, sunshine kills mold. We need to keep putting sunshine on what the Russians are doing, and we have got to uh, have resilient populations that you know, we don't lose trust in our in our institutions. If, if I may add something to what uh, John I just said, um, and just uh, let me use the example of what we do with the uh, the butter group, for example. Uh, we have been delegated the authority on the Stratcom for the battle group. And believe me, that it's not easy task because sometimes we fight against the lack of information of what's going on about the battle group. So if we want to send out a message, I understand that what you mentioned is a, a wider uh, messaging, uh, wider use of uh, communication, but I just stay in a very limited uh, environment, which is what we do for the battle group, what is the impact of the battle group, uh, we have difficulties because we are fighting in an environment where we have the bilateral agreement uh, initiative that are taken by the, the countries, what is done by NATO, and so sometimes this could be leveraged by someone else that has bad intention with that for us to demonstrate that this is a demonstration of uh, lack of cohesion, lack of uh, common interest, and that is simply staying within what is just communicate what the exercise will looks like, what is the program of activities that will be conducted in the countries. I think sometimes uh, I agree with in principle what you say, but sometimes it seems to be very difficult to be realized in uh, in the in the reality. Uh, but I agree with you that the communication is uh, is uh, is a paramount importance. Got time for. Couple more, probably uh, back there with uh, you, Brian, and then over here on the left after that. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Mark Murphy. I'm the uh, PKSOI liaison here in the National Capital Region. Uh, one comment and then one question. Uh, so the one comment that I'll make, and I think we've kind of danced around this a little bit today, uh, but when we talk about the value and, and the efficacy of uh, NATO, I think the one thing that we we tend to forget is that uh, just last week, we celebrated uh, the 17th anniversary of the attacks on the United States. And the fact that the, uh, the only time that NATO Article 5 has been invoked was in response to those attacks. Uh, so when we're talking about the value of NATO, that's a story that I don't think we do a very good job of really communicating, not just to the American people, but also to our leadership writ large, uh, to go and remind them of that very issue. Uh, so I think that's something that uh, we need to highlight and make people understand because we've had our NATO partners standing alongside of us, not just in Afghanistan, but elsewhere, uh, spilling blood and sharing the, the same ground. So uh, that's my comment. Uh, the question I have is one thing that we haven't really discussed is how much of a potential flashpoint is Kaliningrad uh, with respect to what's happening in the Baltics and, and uh, the stationing of certain capabilities up there uh, how does, uh, what's NATO's view and, and what's, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. So, um, the Suwaki Corridor, let me point to it. It's right here. It's, uh, it's the, the little border between, um, Lithuania and Poland, you got Kaliningrad on one side and Belarus on the other side. It's about 60 kilometers wide uh, straight line distance. And there's one railroad and one good road that could sustain heavy uh, armored traffic. 
uh, and that's all it is. And that, that's what connects um, our three allies, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, with the rest of with the rest of Europe. And um, if you accept my premise of what I said earlier, that Russia doesn't want to conquer all of Europe like we expected back during the Cold War, but instead they just want to, as a Russian friend told me, he said, they don't want to destroy the high table, they want to have a seat at the high table. And so um, to do that, to undermine the alliance, they just have to demonstrate that the alliance cannot protect one of its members. And so if you accept that, then all of a sudden the idea of a, of a very quick, short duration uh, strike into Lithuania, for example, in the vicinity of the Suwalki Corridor, um, if they think they could get away from that, go, get away with that, and that some allies might not actually respond, then then they have achieved their strategic effect of undermining the alliance, where you know certain countries say, hmm, man, you know, those Latvians, they treat their ethnic Russians like crap anyway. Um, and uh, there's a reason that Russia always talks about use of nuclear weapons. You know, not knuckleheads in their mother's uh, basement, but ambassadors and ministry officials talk about Denmark. You will be a nuclear target if you put radar on your ships that are part of any kind of missile defense system. Even Sweden, you know, the home of ABBA, you will be a uh, nuclear target if you do anything with the alliance. That's to make sure that all of our civilian leadership has the, in, the nuclear word in, in the front of their mind uh, so that that will be part of their calculation on do they respond to this very limited attack into Lithuania. Um, and if we can't move quickly, if, if, if we couldn't put like a, a brigade up in Suwaki within five or six days on a cold start in peacetime conditions, then I think there is a huge risk that they make a terrible miscalculation and say, hmm, we could probably get away with this and, and that they might actually do it. Now, a lot of people say that's crazy. Why would they do it? And, well, I, I failed to anticipate uh, Crimea. I failed to anticipate Donbass. I failed to anticipate they were going to Syria, which is probably why it says the uh, LTGR uh, here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, that they only respect strength, and if, you know, if we're strong and, and cohesive, then we can play hockey and uh, and do all these other things with them. Yeah, uh, no, no, no doubt that the Swarki Bar gap uh, represents uh, one of the uh, major concern for us, and the presence of the uh, Kaliningrad Oblast as well uh, in terms of uh, uh, potential capability to uh, impede or to uh, disrupt any initiative that we could have in order to reinforce that part of the uh, uh, NATO uh, <clears throat> territory. Um, um, General Hodges mentioned the calculus that we should be done properly to avoid that uh, we uh, take the, the, the wrong decision in the wrong moment. At the same time, we have also to consider that uh, the same calculus probably is also in the Russian hands and uh, to generate a situation in which they would be, uh, we, we would be forced to raise it up to the level of the Article 5, probably is not a, in their interest in any way. So this is something that I know that is not helping in uh, taking a, a military decision, but should be uh, one of the driver of any initiatives. I can just say that, uh, of course, this uh, issue has been very clearly uh, stated in, in uh, the effort that we do in uh, our planning for this possible situation. And this is very much uh, uh, considered and has been also considered by our commanders, uh, General Scaparotti, in terms of how we can manage the situation should the oblast in uh, Kaliningrad be still there, if something uh, go in the direction you mentioned before of a potential military attack even if limited in in the in the baltic's territory we just get the last one really brief here because we're up against it but i appreciate it uh, Colonel slavok utrashvili from georgia it's uh, thank you to having us as an army or college student here so uh, my question is about the uh, coast of georgia and that's a uh, couple months before the war 2008 uh, we did not get map uh, and my question is about it uh, it was a green light for putin uh, to invade the georgia and uh, if it was a green light and uh, it's is it still on today and if it's still on and what's nato is gonna to uh, prevent in the future
Georgians are right to be concerned about that. Um, I, I made exactly that point, that there was a relationship between what happened in Bucharest and what happened uh, uh, four months later um, in August of, of 2008. Um, uh, again, uh, offering some indication to Georgia um, that they will be members, which is what actually the language coming out of Bucharest was. They, you will, Georgia and Ukraine, will be members at some point. Uh, didn't stop him. Um, but but putting, putting some rigor into that, putting some substance into that, um, uh, beginning the membership action plan in one case, or as General Hodges says, admitting Georgia right now, that would turn the light off. I think... Um... There's, there's a near continuous U.S. presence in Georgia already, of course, with the uh, Georgia Army National Guard and the state partnership program. Um, the state of Georgia does a very good job, very active in that, uh, and then exercises uh, with the uh, Marine Corps as well as uh, U.S. Army Europe. So, I mean, there is a, a lot of work that's been done over the last uh, few years uh, that increases that. And then or, we heard earlier today Mr. Uh, Opterai talk about what the alliance is doing there, so there there is increasing presence there, uh, but there there's also a Russian base in Armenia on the south side of Georgia, as well as the 10,000 troops in Abkhazia and South Ossetia that we talked about. So it, I mean, there there is absolutely no doubt a threat, but I would not say that the green light is on. I, I think that the uh, the fact that the vice president was there last summer and you know the decision was made to provide javelin uh, to Georgia. Now, given javelins is not a strategy, but it, it's an important policy decision and a real capability. And I think Georgia has made uh, important decisions. Uh, you have to have a concept of defense before you start buying stuff. And I think previously you had the wrong concept of defense. There's no point in Georgia having an Air Force. It'll disappear in the first 30 minutes. Um, so invest money in countermobility, uh, anti-tank systems, uh, and, and take advantage of the terrain there. Uh, and having a resilient population that makes Georgia indigestible uh, to uh, a Russian attack uh, until your friends do, do, in fact, show up. And I, I think so Georgia, under the current leadership, um, has made the right strategic decisions about a, about a concept uh, of defense. Um, but you know, we uh, the U.S. is, is going to continue uh, to be supportive, and I I think we're going to uh, you know, we waited a long time for Germany to be fully reunited, and, and so um, I think we need to stay single-mindedly focused on that. Please uh, join me in uh, offering our panel a round of applause. So I was thinking through just a few minutes ago uh, that I was going to recap all of your comments. I'm sure everybody wants that right now, right? Um, Daryl on this uh, distinguished panel, thank you so much for taking your time, valuable time to come here. Um, we will continue this di dialogue hopefully in the future. Um, and, I'll, and I'll wrap that up in my notes here and say my thanks. Thank you so much. So I refer back to a time when, uh, uh, speaking of stories, real quick, um, Colonel Tim Sullivan. Uh, can, Tim, are you out there anywhere? You can stand. He loves this uh, type of stuff. Um, sat down with uh, Air Marshal Stacy and was challenged to go ahead and convene and bring forward uh, strategic level issues uh, for NATO. Uh, so Tim started that path uh, quite a few months back. Uh, with the team and has engaged many in the, this audience uh, on this topic. So I'd personally like to say my thanks to Tim. A really great effort and initiative on your part. And I know the director would want to do the same. Um, I, I'm not going to recap uh, what, what we talked about here, but what I'm going to say is we're, we're working on an article through, uh, graciously enough, uh, General Hammond's staff 
have uh, allowed us to go ahead and do a write-up in an article that will be submitted uh, here in October for, I believe, publication serve for December time frame. Uh, we also perpetuate out other uh, rapporteur notes uh, to those that need those notes. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for taking their valuable time, as mentioned before, to come here and have a dialogue on an important topic for our alliance and key partners. Uh, thus, our key partners were right out in the audience. Uh, thank you to our audience members engaging in this dialogue, specifically dialogue I heard outside, uh, outside of the main room, uh, where oftentimes connections and further work uh, continues. Uh, we hope that you have a different uh, perspective of returning to your home office, uh, where you're going back to. And we ask you to go ahead and perpetuate the dialogue. Uh, oftentimes, these one-day uh, get-togethers uh, go ahead and spark um, some ideas, get some crosstalk, and potentially looks at uh, attacking some of those gaps that were mentioned in front, of a, uh, in front of the crowd today and some potential solutions that were mentioned. Uh, last but not least, um, thank you, General Ham. And thank you to General Swan and the rest of the staff. Specifically, uh, uh, General Hamm has great staff that uh, really help facilitate this, and oftentimes those folks don't uh, get mentioned. Uh, specifically, Nzinga, Alana, and Greg. Greg's in the, in the back right there. Uh, have done a phenomenal job with the rest of the AUSA team to help uh, uh, the young colonel, I'm going to emphasize that, um, helping move this forward. Um, our moderators took the time to go ahead and uh, not cold start this, so I was really appreciative of, the, of that, and also the panel members having uh, feedback uh, to develop the dialogue that we had today. Um, and John and Chris from our team, uh, the folks that work behind the scenes, uh, make this a meaningful event, and will continue for the future. Expect to see an article, as I mentioned. Um, Mark your dates on your calendar for right now. We're looking at uh, next September around the same time to focus thematically on uh, the Indo-Pacific. Um, so there'll be hopefully some more uh, news coming on that. Um, I want to uh, go ahead and uh, take the time to talk again to John Weingartner. If John, if you could stand real quick. He's the one who happened to, for, to be from our team right over here on, on my right. Uh, just quick applause. Thank you, John. Um, sir, with that, uh, do you have any other final words? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, this concludes the seminar. Uh, stay, say, have safe travels, um, and it was great to see you today, and hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.